Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Muddy Outdoors, Hoyt Archery, Fuse Accessories, Frigid Forage, Scott Archery, Cabela's, Trophy Rock, Night and Hail Game Calls, TrailCamPro.com, Bloodsport Arrows, Rocket Broadheads, and Nikon. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail. Today's episode is a special one to me. This brings to a close my hunt for the double G4 buck that started four years ago. And I'm going to break the episode up, or we decided to break the episode up into two. Uh, this first one is going to be just the events of uh, last Saturday when I actually shot the buck. And then next week we'll come back with another episode where we go back all the way to the beginning when we first discovered this buck, all the way through the hunts that took place and the close encounters and the lessons learned and really just the entire journey. Because as many of you know, hunting a buck like this is not about the score of the deer, it's really about the adventure and the quest. And that's what we'll dig into next week. But before we jump to the hunt, I'd like to ask your favor again. The vote for the best hunt show on the Sportsman Channel is still continuing. And I've got a link at the bottom right hand corner of the player right now that you can click on and it'll take you to the Sportsman Channel's Facebook page where you can vote. Uh, please vote for Muddy's Midwest Whitetail for the best hunt show. I appreciate it. Thanks for all you do to support us. Now let's get right to the hunt. It's November 3rd and I'm heading back on that same ridge where I've been hunting, hunting the double G4 buck over the last, gosh, I think we started on October 5th back there. I moved the blind off the field. I couldn't take it any longer and I put a tree stand up back there. Some of the footage that we've gotten from the blind, I'm sure you've seen where the buck comes in from the left sometimes. I've got a tree stand right there where he comes up uh, out of the timber on the left side and I'll talk about it some more when I get back in there. but. So it's risky, but uh, something had to change. I was just totally fried from sitting in that ground blind. So I'm going to go back there and give it a try. We were in there a couple of days ago, and uh, we did bump a doe off. She picked up just a little bit of us on the nose and looked down in the timber for a little while and then trotted off the field. So it wasn't like we blew the field, but it does show you that there's definitely some risk with this. Um, hopefully uh, hopefully he'll, he'll come out tonight, and if he's the first year out, we'll be in good shape. But otherwise, we might be in trouble. Right off of the big valley behind me. So I think they can do 
conditions are right. Should be close range. If he comes up on this trail, it's going to be 15 yards. And I can't tell you how much I would like to see a 15-yard shot on that buck. some antlerless deer down on the big and beastie plot but the conditions are actually perfect as the day wind has dropped off the thermals have kicked in it's running right down behind me right into this ditch right down in the valley below so if the g4 buck comes up this ridge on this side we should be just fine anything out here uh, there shouldn't be any chance of them uh, picking me up in the tree stand now as long as this wind stays really low like it is right now basically still those thermals are going to keep pulling our scent right down this valley
say about that. I was shaking for 15 minutes before that shot. I think he's down. I mean, he crashed into that fence and nothing. Man. There was a guy of drug on left after that. He's 51 yards. I swore I wasn't going to take a shot past 40, but there's no wind, and he was looking the other way, feeding, completely relaxed. I don't know whether to feel excited or to feel a little bit sad, because that deer, I'm assuming he's down, I and mean, it's, he's been here for, we started hunting him in 2009, so this is the fourth season of hunting that buck. It's amazing, really. I thought when he jumped the fence that we weren't going to have a crack at him because he, he zipped across the backside of that ridge and I grunted at him 
something that got his attention was about the fifth or sixth grunt. He just, for whatever reason, he wasn't hearing it. And it's dead still out here. I mean, you could hear a pin drop. And he finally heard it. And he came back again to the left. And I wanted him to come about 15 yards closer. But we're down to about the last 10 minutes of shooting, of legal shooting time now. So I couldn't wait any longer. Oh, man. That, that took every ounce of energy I had to stay focused on that shot. Because I was shaking. Most of the time when I walk up here after an encounter with that buck, I've got a frown on my face. But uh, I'm pretty sure he's dead. He busted over the hill. We heard him crash into a fence. And then a couple of thumps. And then nothing. So that tells me that he's piled up down there by that fence. But we're going to go back, give him a little bit of time. Uh, I'm going to grab the family and come out. They've been part of this since the beginning, too. So that's the plan right now, is to go grab the family and come back and see if he's laying there. Well, I know he hit the fence, so we'll just walk over to the fence and walk the fence down and see if we can find where he went through there. I'd say this is where he went. See all that hair? Why don't you guys just wait here for a second? I think he's still alive. I think he's still alive. Fine. No, I found where he bedded. But there's a heck of a blood trail leading to the bed. I mean, it was, you can follow it at a run. He went around the side hill, like I said, real good blood trail the whole way around, and then found a bed. And I thought, ooh, you know, that's not good. And I stood there for a while, listening and looking, and I could see blood trail going away from the bed, going up the hill. So that's, <clears throat> that's good at least. A lot of times when you have a bed, there's no blood trail after the bed. Right. Um, had to have been, the only thing I can guess is it was single lung and liver because um, there's plenty of bright red blood. I won't say it's spraying out, um, but uh, I mean, there's no doubt that the deer is going to die. So I don't know, I guess we just have to come back and look in the morning. The drama continues. <laughs> it's never easy with this deer. about 12 15 in the morning uh, so it's been six hours since I hit that buck and we looked at the footage again and he was angling toward me just a little bit and I didn't I didn't see that when I took the shot I thought he was broadside uh, but that might have led to this type of a hit because the impact looked good so I think it's probably one lung liver is probably what it is it's definitely liver blood that I found when it was when I was in here earlier so hopefully he's laying there dead uh, we're going to pick the blood trail up right where I left it earlier. Okay, here's the bed that he was in. And it usually gets really tricky after they bed. Uh, when I was in here earlier, I did find a couple of drops going up the hill. I only went just a few feet and then I stopped. I thought I could hear him up ahead and I don't hear anything now, but so it's going to get a lot harder now to sort out the blood trail, but hopefully he's not too far. Usually 
Yeah, those liverheads, when they start wandering like this, they're done. I've ran out of blood on this blood trail. There's been a lot of beds real close together along this side of the hill, just, I mean, five yards apart. And that usually means that the deer is really close to dead. I mean, it's, I've seen it before on bucks that were hit in the liver, and they'll bed real quickly, and then you won't have any blood trail anymore. And, you know, it's no point in really crashing around in here doing a carcass search. I'm pretty sure he's gotta be close by here now. I mean, it's, he's lost a lot of blood, and with these beds just stacked up on top of each other like that, he's gotta be here pretty close. But uh, it's always easier to look for him with a little bit of daylight. And I haven't heard any coyotes, uh, so I don't think there's any threat of the coyotes getting to him. It's getting late into the morning now. So I'm gonna pull out of here and uh, come back at first light, see if I can find him then. It just seems like this story of this buck just doesn't end. We got one more chapter. We got the recovery yet. We're back at the spot uh, from where I left the blood trail off last night. We should be able to find that buck because it's pretty open timber. It shouldn't be too hard to find him if he's laying here dead. And I can't imagine he went very much further. We're just gonna kind of spread out here and see if we can pick the blood back up again. And if not, we'll just go for a little walk here and see if we can find him. Here's another bed, look at this. Boy, just boom, boom. Beds are right on top of each other. But he's gotta be right close now. I'm guessing he's right along here. And then I can see him up there. See him right there? Yeah. The size of that thing. Cool. <laughs> man, oh man. Look at here's Rodhead sticking out on that side of him. Oh man. Look at the head on that thing. Hmm. Well, you don't see deer like that very often. Wow, he's huge. He is huge. He's definitely a, well, it's seven and a half year old deer. Yeah. That's cool. Well, that's quite a story on this buck. Quite a humbling thing, really, to be able to hunt a deer like that. And I just thank God that we have the opportunity to do things like this, the, the blessing of being able to do the things that we love to do. Man, that's awesome. I see the arrow. Uh -huh. Sticking it right there. No, right there in that bush. See that, where we came up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wow, it's quite a dream come true, really. I've been after this deer for so long. Seven and a half year old buck. He was four years old, 2009, when I started hunting him. That's pretty amazing. He's all beat up from fighting, too, see that? Mm -hmm. All that hair missing. What a deer. So you're still gonna get, when you get him mounted, are you still gonna get that cape on him? I don't know, I might. This is, those battle scars have stories to tell. So we've got the yeah. video footage of, of him fighting the night when he lost that hair. Because huh. the next day that he came out, all the hair was missing on his shoulders. Huh. So we actually have footage of him fighting the buck. I wonder which deer that was. That'd be interesting to know, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, we've got the deer out here, we can get a better look at him. As you can tell, he looks just as big on the ground as he looked on the hoof. I couldn't be more excited about the hunt that we had for this buck yesterday and just the, the way the whole story of the G4 buck turned out. But one thing I want to talk about 
is what we noticed about this deer this year. And the, the behavior that he had this year that was unique uh, compared to in the past. If you remember back to the 2011 season, G5 buck was the dominant deer in this area. He came in and stole a doe away from this buck on the 9th of November when I killed the G5 buck. But then we also noticed that after the G5 buck was gone off this ridge, this deer seemed to take over. He was a lot more visible the whole second half of November, all the way through December and through the late season, up until the time he shed his antlers in, in late January, this deer was out on this ridge just pretty much nonstop. He owned it. And we saw that same behavior carry over to this year. When he'd come into the field, he would run the other bucks out. And in one case, after the end of legal shooting time, with the camera gain set real high, we actually caught him in a knockdown drag out fight with another buck. In fact, if you look at him here, he's all bruised up, he's missing a bunch of hair. This hair was there one day, and the next day when we came back, the hair was gone. The only thing that happened in between is he got into a fight with the buck on the other end of this ridge. So it was, it was interesting to watch all the personalities uh, sort of unfold on these bucks as we would, you would see how they interacted with each other, you know, how he established his dominance on the ridge, and then little by little how all the other bucks just stayed completely away. So now as I start looking at my prospects for the rest of the season, I'm struck with the fact that our farm seems a lot more empty now without this buck here. It's been four years that I've been hunting this deer. So every time I get up in the morning during the hunting season, I'm always thinking to myself, in the back of my mind, I need to try to find a way to get on that buck. You know, what's my strategy for today? You know, do I hang back today? Do I make my move today? Four seasons worth of hunting have really revolved around this one deer. So finally being able to connect with this buck kind of puts you in a little bit of a, a bittersweet position, I think. So I sit here with a definite sense of sadness that the buck is no longer gonna be here to hunt but I have a great sense of satisfaction in finally harvesting the G4 buck. Well, I'm all smiles now, but I guarantee you along the way there were a lot of evenings uh, where I left the field chasing this buck where there wasn't a smile on my face. But really it's that journey, it's the ups and downs, it's the highs and lows that really forges uh, what becomes a trophy. In this case, we're gonna come back again next week and get into a lot more of that in the next episode. Uh, but for now, I'd like to say thank you to everybody that congratulated me on this buck. I got a lot of outpouring uh, from the fans and the viewers of Midwest Whitetail uh, congratulating me on the G4 buck. It's very humbling to see that much support and really the blessings that God has given me, the chance to do what I love to do and to hunt deer like this is something that I don't take for granted, nor do I take your support for granted. So thank you very much for that. And next week, we're going to come back again. We're really going to dig into the whole story of this buck. And there's a lot to learn along the way. We'll touch on some lessons. Well, I appreciate you joining me this week. We'll be right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.